Thank you for coming on short notice. Last Wednesday, I had this idea. Oh my gosh, the 50th is next week, and I should be doing something about this, but it was Holy Week, and it was like that. 14 other high priority items that day that needed my attention, but I did manage to sit down with Rod and say, this is totally unrelated to the Holy Week, but there's this kind of big day coming next week, and I'd like to try and do something if I could, and uh, it's, uh, the material is uh, a great passion with me these days. And so I'll just kind of uh, give you a little bit of background on myself and why I'm doing these kinds of projects and just kind of what I do when I'm not at a manual. Um, I grew up in California and uh, my father was involved with uh, UNESCO and kind of all things United Nations. His career was in international education. And when he was a student after the war, after World War II, um, he was involved in the movement of students in the U.S. and other countries that were not um, physically impacted by the war in helping the students of Europe and Japan to rebuild their lives. Um, the war had a tremendous effect on students. Um, universities were damaged and sometimes destroyed completely. Um, their families were impacted. There was no money to continue going to school. Um, and so American students you know, came over. My father led student work trips where they rebuilt bicycle paths or you know, did other things that would really help um, students and helping institutions um, kind of cobble together a way to keep their uh, classes going and um, they brought clothing, they brought all the kinds of things that um, you need after your city has been bombed. Um, uh, but their goal was to um, support the students in continuing to um, get an education. Uh, there were many students uh, who came to the United States because their home university had been destroyed. Um, or they had relatives here and they could live here and go to school in the States. Um, and so there was a lot of activity and my father decided that after the war, um, the thing that he felt he could contribute uh, uh, in creating peace in the world was to do international educational exchange. And so that was what his career was in. And in 1960, he got the great job of coming up with a new junior year abroad program for the University of California system. And uh, what does that have to do with Martin Luther King? Well, long story short, I grew up in a very um, kind of international environment, uh, a parade of international dignitaries um, from different academic institutions came through our home. Um, so it was a great privilege to to meet um, lots of world leaders. And I, uh, for some reason, really developed a, uh, empathy for Africa because my father had um, several programs there. And um, as I developed musically, I got very interested in, in African music, uh, but also got very interested in African-American uh, music and culture and uh, met some people that really influenced that um, in me. And I had always kind of played in garage bands in high school. And so I was always sort of one foot in the rock folk world and another foot in the classical world. And I went to very fine schools for choir, um, choral music, basically kind of conservatory level kinds of places. But I always kept my guitar close by and I uh, was writing songs in other styles, not just in the classical world that I was immersed in. And so um, I, was at, I, I was at University of Illinois, but I transferred to St. Olaf and, and I had a couple of really um, 
mountaintop experiences there. Singing in the choir was wonderful. We sang some African American spirituals, and um, but I I started getting a real passion for social justice, um, and contemplated like going to Russia and smuggling Bibles and all this kind of stuff that you know sounded very exciting. But I talked with the head of the Lutheran World Federation, and you know about you know what what I could do. He said, "Well, what do you do?" I said, well, "I'm a I'm a musician, and I you know I'm a bit of a songwriter." I said, "Well, why don't you do that? And you know you can you can help the world tremendously through that." And, you know, but I want to be like James Bond, of, you know. Um, but he was right, and that you know that. You know, he, he really encouraged me to look at how my gifts would, um, how I could use the things that I was really good at to um, to achieve what I wanted to achieve. Basically, how can I use the arts to uh, raise awareness, raise consciousness, to help people? And so that started me on a path that um, led to some pretty significant um, projects and um, I've been able to um, do a lot of this kind of work. And in the year 2000, back to my father and UNESCO, my, my father got to be, I don't think I, I shared, my father got to, as a student at Illinois, my father got to be the assistant to the head of the American delegation at the founding convention of UNESCO. And UNESCO is the United Nations Education, Science, and Cultural Organization. Um, and they do kind of all of the cultural work of the UN. You know, the UN does lots of policy and, you know, helping the world be a safer place and helping countries get along. Um, UNESCO was about the cultural exchanges and the, you know, how can we um, share with one another, and, uh, and and UNESCO is also involved. You might have heard of um, different places like uh, the Easter Islands and the, the statues there that you're probably aware of. That is a UNESCO cultural site. So if UNESCO has declared certain places around the world as like super important, so. Um, so, in the year 2000, at the millennium, UNESCO um, created the Culture of Peace Pledge. And it was six behaviors that people could sign a pledge to um, make the world a safer, um, more peaceful place. Um, listen to understand, reject violence, share with others, those kinds of things. And uh, I looked at these six points, and they were all, um, it, you know, it looked like a great idea for a concert of my music because I was doing this kind of work. And so my father and I put together a concert based on, on that, um, based on the pledge. And so um, it was those kinds of activities that um, kind of led me to. Um, work on larger and larger projects. And when I was at St. Olaf, I always kind of wondered, Martin Luther King. Hmm. Maybe there's some connection there. And 20 years later in 1999, I got the chance to um, look at that connection. I did an oratorio. Um, I, I got about half of an oratorio done. It was on um, Luther's life, but I also wanted to see how Luther had impacted other historical figures, uh, such as Bach, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and then Dr. King. And I, so I looked and I did uh, find pretty quickly that Dr. King had been named for Luther. And um, that was kind of a really cool um, thing. And I got fascinated with that part so, so much that I kind of abandoned the larger Luther project and began really focusing on the story of how Dr. King came by his name. 
and this has uh, started out as more of an oratorio idea where it might be like Dad, Daddy King, Dr. King's father, who was the one who changed their names, and um, an choir and a few minor characters. But the more I learned about uh, Daddy King's life, the more I realized he needs his own show. So that's what I'm working on. But in the process, um, I've really dis I've discovered that um, Dr. King called on Luther many, many times throughout his work. And um, so, so the connection that we can make with uh, Luther and, and Dr. King are, uh, are, are pretty consistently there. If you look at um, the main moments in Dr. King's work, the Montgomery bus boycott was the first um, national level uh, action Dr. King took. Uh, in, in Time Magazine, after the bus boycott was successful, and that's the Rosa Parks moment, you know, when she didn't want to move to the back of the bus. You're all, probably all familiar with that. Um, they won, and Dr. King said in Time Magazine, maybe now my father and I have earned the right to our name. So he was pointing to Luther as um, a, a role model worth uh, striving to um, live up to. Um, so let me just skip ahead here a little bit so we can make some connections. Uh, I wonder if you might know any things that Dr. King and Luther might have in common. There's a, a few of them. And Steve, you can speak after no one else has spoken. <laughs> you probably know a few. One at least I'm thinking of. So think about who they were. The both reformers. Okay, that's very true. Major leaders of social change, significant, huge social change, on the same scale, really. Who did Luther take on? Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, and who specifically? Pope. Who would be the person representing that? The Pope. The Pope, yeah. So. That's a pretty big deal. And back in that time, 500 years ago, the Pope was pretty darn powerful. Um, and uh, who did Dr. King take on? Well, like the whole country. <laughs> he had to change many, many hearts and minds. Um, just basic things, like what they do for a living. Preachers. Preachers, yeah. So they're pastors. Preachers, for sure. What about education? So Luther was Dr. Luther, right? He was a doctorate in theology, probably Dr. Theology. Yeah. And we all know Dr., the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He also, I believe, had a doctorate in theology. Um, Both authors. Voluminously, yes. Voluminous authors. Champions for the common people. Champions of common people. Okay. Yeah. Champions. What about their home life? Luther didn't marry till very late in life. He was a Catholic priest for many years, but he eventually did find Katharina, right? She found him. And we all know about Coretta, so they were both husbands. Um, they were both fathers. I've had, a, I've had the privilege of meeting all but one of Dr. King's children. 
Um, what about their character, just their personality? You don't think of Dr. King as a fun guy, probably. But his job was pretty serious, but when he was not on, he was he could be pretty silly. He was he was very fun loving, always joking. Uh, in fact, the day that he was killed, earlier in the day, um, they had a huge pillow fight in his motel room. <laughs> feathers flying everywhere, the whole, the whole thing. So he loved a good laugh. Um, and we know from Luther's table talk and other um, writings of his that he had a pretty good sense of humor himself. I'm, I'm going to put y'all on the spot a little bit. Anybody have a favorite? Luther story. Of, I, I didn't have time to find my favorite funny Luther story, but if you th if you think of Steve, do you have a a Luther story? <laughs> <laughs> like, How about an oldie and spend joke? No, don't get me started. But anyway, but you know, legendary uh, sense of humor. The bigger part of their um, personality is that they both really appreciated and tried to create what it begins with a C. Yeah. Um, the fact that Luther's home was basically open to students, community members. There was a, just a constant stream of people. He had a big house, so he could repair upstairs if he needed to. But um, you were welcome in Martin Luther's home. And Katerina was a wonderful spirit. Um, good times always going on there. And Dr. King, when he was around long enough, he, he was uh, probably traveled quite a bit more than, than Luther. Um, but he, um, he imagined an even larger community. What was that? Anybody remember the what beloved. that was called? The yeah, beloved. the Beloved. Was um, MLK a, a, a composer or a writer? No, but he loved music. Uh, he loved opera. He, you know, his wife was a classically trained soprano, went to the Boston of the New England Conservatory, rather. Um, so um, I don't, I don't know of any songs that he wrote, but um, he loved to listen to the Metropolitan Opera broadcast as he was driving. Um, he loved that about his wife that she could sing. Um, so this notion of beloved community. Uh, you, you may know the name John Lewis, Senator John Lewis from Georgia. He was uh, a student um, worker at the time of Selma and uh, was one of the people that was quite badly beaten up um, during a couple of those different actions. Um, and he continues today to be one of the um, he, he's kind of the dean of the, of the old guard civil rights leaders. Um, he said that the civil rights movement, more than anything, was a movement of love. And the beloved community was really about agape love. And the idea that there's a lot of different kinds of love the love between man and wife. Oh, hi, honey. <laughs> that's agape love. Yeah. That's someone from my daughter's school in Michigan, but I'll uh, have to turn this thing off. <laughs> agape love is that divine love, and the way that we can translate that for human relations is that um, it's the, the sense that I wish for you the highest good and you wish for me the highest good. 
And if the highest good is the love of God, then this idea is that if we can have a community where we all hold ourselves to um, see each other as important enough that we, um, that every member of the community deserves to be loved with, with uh, the highest of intentions, that, to, you know, that we should love each other the way God loves us. Okay? And so what the leaders really tried to do um, and this was essential, an essential idea to the work of nonviolent social change, um, was to um, let this guide every action. And so um, when they, you know, they actually did role playing where Okay, they're going to go do a sit-in at a coffee shop that doesn't serve blacks. And they were trained very intentionally uh, to not fight back, even if they were beat with sticks or worse, um, that, that, that they would focus on loving their oppressors. And the way Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Um, love your enemies, and and that is indeed what um, got eventually got the attention of the American people was that here were these people who were not fighting; they were not being aggressive. They simply demanded to be treated respectfully, and so they. They caught on camera people being bludgeoned and fire hosed and bitten by dogs and um, beaten by other people with billy clubs, baseball bats, and worse. Um, and the only way that the people were able to endure that was because they were trained to love their enemies, and that that was the way of Christ. And it was not always the most popular approach. Um, there were many people that um, you know, they wanted to have revenge, they wanted to fight fire with fire. But Dr. King was able to galvanize <coughs> the people and um, and it was this notion of, of love that was able to um, make that possible so that by the time you know and, and they and they went into Birmingham on purpose because they knew that the chief of police in Birmingham was the most notorious bigot that um, there was, and they really wanted to call him out, goad him into a major um, reaction of force so that the camera crews would catch it, so the reporters would take pictures. Um, so that was calculated, and he knew, and the people knew, that they would be suffering greatly that day. Um, so it took a lot of courage to um, be on the front line of this movement. And uh, so when, when we sing that song, We Shall Overcome, it, it's, it is not anything to be sung lightly, because there are people that literally laid down their lives. Um, they're just, just at the monument in Montgomery, there's a beautiful monument, it's black, granite, and um, there are carved in the stone um, 46 names of people that have been killed that were martyrs um, of the movement, and many more, that was, and that was just since 
Um, I think the oldest one was in the 40s. Um, but there were, of course, many, many people that had been lynched. And, too many martyrs to, to name, but um, so when we sing these songs from the civil rights movement uh, down by the riverside, study war no more, um, it's important to kind of remember that these were songs that they sang to keep their spirits up and to endure the, uh, the persecution and to live to march another day. Uh, live to protest another day. So, so how did these two get connected? Well, that's where you know Martin Luther King Jr. Now you're going to get to know a little bit about Senior. Dr. King's father was born Michael Luther King uh, in 1899. Uh, his father wanted him to be named Martin Luther King because James, the father, had two brothers named Martin and Luther. And it's kind of a preposterous notion, but that is what the family says. I haven't been able to do the ancestry uh, search on, on that, but that's what Daddy King says in his autobiography. However, Delia, his wife, James's wife, did not want to name her child Martin. He was the firstborn son. The father thought that he should have the right to name the boy. Um, but for some reason, Delia didn't want to name him Martin. Uh, she insisted on a biblical name. Um, I think that she probably just didn't like his brother Martin. Wasn't going to be naming her child after your no-count brother. Um, and so that's kind of my hypothesis, and I put that in the show because who knows anyway. But um, So I'm going to play you a little bit of the beginning and that sort of tells a little bit of that story. There's a, um, another uh, aspect of my work that I am um, quite fond of. I've taken some of Luther's own chorale melodies. There's probably half a dozen songs in the ELW that were written by Luther. And uh, a couple of his Lenten songs are kind of in minor modes and they sound a little bluesy. And so um, I, I took some of his uh, songs and use them as the melodic material. I kind of chop them up a little bit here and there. But um, uh, one of the, I can't, I always forget which one's which, but I think this one is uh, From Sorrow Deep I Cry to Be. <laughs> Stated. So it's just kind of fun to throw some of Luther's uh, songs in there, and they lend themselves very well to black side. Uh, that melody comes back uh, when when uh, Michael he gets named Michael. Uh, there's a train that goes through their town, and uh, a couple of different times he jumps the train to get away, and so he sings, "I couldn't follow Papa." On the farm there was no way, no more that did. There was no way that there could there be any different for me. And so that's the, the, the tune gets taken several several different ways there. So my computer's been a little finicky. Well, 
like a mournful spiritual. Thank you. 
catch it um, daddy King as a 12 year old got to go down with his father to sell his cotton crop for the year and he went once a year and got paid once a year and had to make all of that money last for the whole year and um, Michael could tell that he was getting cheated and he said something about it and basically was challenging the white guy that was in charge of the, the elevator. And uh, uh, the guys, the other farmers and stuff that were, that were there, um, you know, they kind of, in a humorous way, uh, try to you know say tell the guy's name was settle up uh, that uh, that he ought to he ought to give the man what what he deserved and so he did pay him you know the correct amount but then the next day they came and kicked the family off the off the farm and so this family with nine children was out of a the house they spent three days on the side of the road trying to figure out what to do next. And so that, you know, when we say Jim Crow, you've heard the term Jim Crow before, that right there is Jim Crow. Blacks didn't have 
enemy power. Um, this was all kind of a handshake deal. You do what you're, you know, you, you keep our deal, you work to the bone, you deliver a crop, and you take what you're given, or else. And later, um, in his civil rights work, Dr. King's father um, was all about voter registration, changing the laws, because he knew that until you had a law that could, that you could go to to get justice, then all these little handshake deals and backroom deals, negotiations, uh, they could be reneged any time, reneged on by the, the whites. And so um, he was one of the main people in the 20s and 30s, especially into the 40s, that um, wasn't going to uh, be treated with disrespect. And he worked very, very hard to uh, build um, a base of power in the, in the black community that was based on the legal system. So, um, Daddy King's story is, is um, really quite remarkable. He, went, he loved going to school, but he could only go to school maybe three months out of the year because his father needed him. He was the oldest son. But when he did go to school, he had no books, not even a chalkboard. It was basically the teacher imparting her knowledge, uh, maybe making your letters in the dirt. So by the time he did finally leave the farm, he jumped a train and didn't come back, moved to Atlanta, which is about 30 miles um, away. I got to drive that uh, distance this summer uh, when I was in Atlanta. Excuse me, no, it was in January, just before I came here, that I went to Stockbridge. That's where he was uh, born. Um, he uh, wanted to go to college because he had fallen in love with this girl who was going to Spelman College, a girls' woman's school. And she was the daughter of the pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church, who was the president at the time of the NAACP in Atlanta. And uh, his his uh, buddies at the boarding house he stayed in, you know, they they just razzed him mercilessly because they said, there's no way she's going to take a country bumpkin like you. So he, he went, applied at Morehouse, and they gave him some tests, and they said, um, you have some remedial work to do. Uh, you can go to this preparatory school and start back in the fifth grade. And uh, if you want to do that, you come back when you're, when you're um, through your high school um, degree. And so in five years, he started back in the fifth grade with a lot much younger students. He was 20 years old at the time. And he did it. Five years later, he was at Morehouse, and it took him five years to finish Morehouse, and he was not a brilliant student, but he toughed it out and got a degree in theology. And uh, at that time, he was the co-pastor, the assistant pastor at Ebenezer. He eventually got to marry the girl, and, uh, and uh, her father brought him on as associate pastor, and when he died in 1931, uh, he, um, Daddy King became the pastor at Ebenezer. And right away, as soon as he became senior minister, he talked to all the other pastors in the black community and wanted to get them to do joint actions. He wanted to organize and do joint voter registration drives, and really, you know, show the, 
powers that be that they were going to be united and a force to be reckoned with. But the other churches, the other pastors were not as courageous as he. They, um, they did not go for it. And so he told Ebenezer that uh, we're going to do this. It's important. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to mount a voter registration drive. And they did it. Um, he had been very important as an associate pastor in helping the congregation achieve financial stability. And he continued to grow the church and um, uh, turn things around. They got foreclosed on one time by some fluke thing that happened, and he raised the money that day and got, you know, got the lock taken off the church door. Um, so he was um, a very effective uh, pastor. Um, and so in the early 30s, it was Daddy King who was the guy that was willing to stand up to and, and speak truth to power and be bold and be out there. And so um, later on, there's another guy that got up and said, here I stand. Um, when James King, his father, um, got sick and came to Atlanta. Um, he kind of cleaned up his act. Um, James's wife, Delia, Michael's mother, had passed away when Michael was 24. There's another song um, of Luther's. And this one, I, 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 I was like, I've got the same words stuck in my head, so I'll just use those too. But there's a very powerful, mournful song. From sorrow deep I cry to thee. And that's uh, Psalm 51, I think. And when Michael's brothers uh, come to tell him that his mother is sick, um, I give that melody to him. My brothers came one day to tell me mama was very sick. So keep weaving in Luther's melodies. Um, so Delia was dying. She had a tumor on her neck and was in a lot of pain. And Michael blamed the hard life that they had had to lead um, the physical and emotional abuse of um, Jim Crow culture. Um, no health care, no doctors, you know. Um, and so he's very angry at the white system. And one night he told his mother as she was lying there um, just how much he hated white people for what they'd done to her. And she said, no, no, you must not hate. Hatred only makes more hatred, Michael. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. So she was able to move him out of that place. She made him swear that he would not hate white people. They mean you can't be angry at them, but there's a difference. Um, and so when it comes to this idea of agape love, that goes back to 
his mother on her deathbed. I'm going to fast forward to you because we're kind of running out of time. In the show, that, that idea um, comes full circle. The show is going to end um, with the beloved community. And what other ways did Daddy King demonstrate his ability to rise above tragedy and continue to love? But we all know what happened to Martin on this day 50 years ago. I got the t-shirt. Um, I went down to the Lorraine Motel um, in October, and they have a wonderful museum there, and it's quite, uh, quite something. I encourage all of you to take that opportunity if it ever comes. It might be a good mission trip. Um, so Dr. King was killed, but then nine months later, uh, Dr. King's brother, uh, Daddy King's only other son, A.D. Williams, who was also a pastor and also in the movement with Martin, he was drowned in his own swimming pool at, in the wee hours of the morning under very suspicious circumstances. They've never figured out what happened, but um, there, was, there were no chemicals in his body. How did he end up in the pool? And if that wasn't enough, in 1970, whether 71 or 74, I can't remember, um, it was Easter Sunday. His wife, who he called Bunch, short for Bunches of Love, Bunch, and she just always called him King. King? <laughs> um, she was the organist at the church and had been the choir director and, and she was playing the organ that day and she had just got finished playing the Lord's Prayer on the organ when a madman, a, he was African American, but a crazy guy, came in with a gun and stood up on one of the pews and just announced that he, you know, he was gonna, he was in charge now and uh, he just began shooting people and um, he shot a deacon who passed away, and then he shot Mama King, and she died at the organ on Easter Sunday. So think about, <laughs> I was playing the organ on Easter Sunday. <laughs> um, so if you imagine that happening you know, to your wife in, after having lost your two sons, um, he was 75 years old at the time. That'd be enough to do me in. I mean, I, I, I don't know that, that I could have continued to say that I don't hate. Um, but he insisted with his family <laughs> that um, there are mysteries that we cannot understand, um, but that we were called to forgive. <coughs> and don't let me ever catch any of you hating anybody. We love everybody, even the man that did this. So, um, that's the guy that was the father, not just of Dr. King, but two other children. He has a sister, Christine, who I met, and many grandchildren. Um, so this guy, um, he did not raise Martin Luther King to become Martin Luther King. Um, I go back to um, a, story, a story that I love about Leonard Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein wrote West Side Story and many other wonderful musical works. 
I got to sing under him when I was in graduate school. And uh, his father was a beauty supply salesman and had invented a one of those things that when you put over their heads and it cooks their curls in somehow. Um, you know, he was a businessman, a salesperson, and he, he knew nothing about music. And his famous saying about his son was, how was I supposed to know that he would become Leonard Bernstein? You know, it wasn't because of him. You know, he didn't, he kind of begrudged, you know, paying for his lessons. Um, so, uh, not the same, not the same with the King family. Daddy King was a moral, ethical rock. Um, Martin had seen some shoes at a white-owned shoes, a white-owned department store downtown, and he wanted to ask his dad. I think he was six years old at the time. Asked his dad if they could go look at the shoes. And he said, okay, so they drove down there, and uh, the shoes were displayed in the front. So they went in the front door, and that was a that was a, you know that was not okay, and the. The clerk came up to them and uh, said, you'll need to go to the back room and I'll help you there. He said, no, we're fine right here. My son would like to see those shoes. Um, I said, well, we can show them to you, but you'll have to go into the back, back of the store. He said, I don't need to go in the back of the store. We just want to buy these shoes. Would you get us some shoes that we can try on? And you know, the guy just started turning purple and um, and he, um, he, he, he wouldn't budge, and so Daddy King just left in the hub. He said, come on, Martin, Martin at that point. He called him ML. <clears throat> Dr. King was ML to a lot of his family. Um, and he writes in his autobiography about how Martin couldn't understand why he couldn't get the shoes, and having to explain to him um, that um, he was sorry, but he was not going to be treated that way. He was not going to be disrespected that way. And that we'd have to find some other shoes because the people in that store are um, you know, not behaving well because they think blacks have to. Yeah, but, yeah. So you shared part of the story with me before, but I think, and, and you kind of shared with the, uh, the audience here about how a guy's named Michael, but you never talked about the trip. Oh, yeah, yeah, trip. yeah, yeah. Um, so. That's what I'm telling you now, because you got the right second. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to finish that, um, you know, that, that was Daddy King being a role model for his son. And that was an indelible thing that Martin never forgot. Um, and so all of, Dr. all of Daddy King's children got that um, upbringing. And they, and they all came along on a lot of the, the actions. So the famous trip. So Daddy King had gotten Ebenezer through the Depression very successfully. He was the highest paid black preacher in town, and the church was very proud of that. They took care of their, their pastor well. And so they gifted him <coughs> with a uh, pilgrimage, a two-month long pilgrimage, uh, to the Holy Land, Egypt, Northern Africa, Greece, Rome, Paris, and finally ending up in Berlin for the World Baptist Convention. Now, it was a two-month trip. So for seven weeks, they, while they were traveling, there were not Jim Crow laws in the Middle East and Europe. I think that the cultures of that 
area still today are famous for uh, hospitality. There are obvious you know, issues between those countries now. Um, but still, even in Europe, um, an African American person is just another person. And so it was like a seven week vacation from racism of the kind that, you know, southern Jim Crow racism. And so then he gets to Berlin, it's 1934, and there's a big convention of the, the World Baptist Alliance. But already in 1934, swastikas everywhere, <laughs> Nazis are in power now, and Adolf Hitler's speeches are being blared on loudspeakers in the street. And though they tried to um, persuade these Baptists that they were just like them, they're clean living, well organized, uh, good morals, um, you know, nicely dressed, short haircuts, um, nice mustaches, um, that uh, that you know that they were that they kind of propagandized them to think that the Nazis were good people. But they had already been persecuting Jews and blacks. And um, this was the subject of hot debate. So the convention was split about whether they would um, you know, work with the Nazis, who would probably control somewhat the access to um, mission activity and different things. So do we work with these people or not? Um, Daddy King was in the camp of, no, we're not going to work with you. And so when he got to Berlin and saw all that, it was like a slap in the, in the face, a wake-up call after this seven-month vacation where he could go to whatever restroom, whatever restaurant, whatever hotel. He could go anywhere he wanted. And all of a sudden, in Berlin, in the middle of Europe, in Luther's country, he's... Um, uh, being treated more like home, and it, he didn't like it. I mentioned to you that, um, well, you, uh, you've, you've heard about James King's brothers, Martin and Luther. Um, what happened after his mother died, James, his father, started telling him that his real name was Martin, that he... Uh, had named him Martin, but Mike was just like a nickname. Um, and he kept pestering him about it. But because James was kind of abusive and they had some issues, Mike didn't just you know, say, sure, Dad, I'll change the name I've had for 24 years. Um, he, he didn't do it. When James got sick and moved to Atlanta, he cleaned up his life and uh, he started pestering Michael again about changing his name, and this kept up and kept up. Well, finally, on his deathbed in 1933, um, Michael finally said, okay, I'll do it. What about Mike Jr.? Well, change his name too, like father, like son. And um, so, did he go down to the courthouse right away and get it done? No, he's a busy guy, it's a depression, he's working hard. A year goes by, and he's off to Germany, still hasn't done it. Has this whole experience, the vacation feeling, and then this uh, slap in the face when he gets to Berlin. One of the things that you can do at the convention is take a little side trip to the Luther places, where the sites of the Reformation where Luther did his work. One hour south of Berlin is Wittenberg, where the famous uh, nailing of the 95 theses on the door of the castle church. And so I think that, we don't know for sure, but I think Daddy, came, Daddy King came through the door and into the castle church, and when he walked up to the pulpit, there in front of the pulpit is the gravestone of Martin Luther. He's buried right there by the pulpit. So Rod, if you have a 
final resting place, maybe Emmanuel will take you back. <laughs> um, but uh, I think he saw his name carved in stone and thought, okay, Lord, now I get it. Uh, I can be the Luther of Atlanta. I am the Luther of Atlanta. Um, and something happened. Don't know why, but when he gets back to Atlanta, he's been gone two months, and uh, they throw a welcome home banquet, and that is the occasion where he chooses to announce that he's changing his name, and little Mike will now be Martin Luther King Jr., and so it's kind of two stories that come together, um, and in fact, Daddy King does go on, and when he comes back, he starts raising the bar. He starts working on getting equal pay for black teachers. Imagine what that did to the Board of Education. Um, it took 11 years to get that done. So he didn't uh, he didn't cave. He you know he didn't get it done in seven years or in three years, but he got it done. And there was a mayor that came in, Mayor Hartsfield. The airport's named after him, uh, who was willing to work with Daddy King and the black community, and they got other things done. They uh, integrated the black they integrated the police force. So Atlanta became this progressive city. They're considered the most progressive city in the South. And I think they call it like the New York of the South or the something of the South. Um, whereas Memphis today, um, they never got over the assassination of Dr. King. It is the poorest metropolitan area in the country, Memphis. So the argument can be made that without Daddy King, um, Atlanta may not have become this progressive community, at least it might not have happened as quickly. And you'll find out in your lives that one thing builds on another. The decisions you make now are going to affect where you go, and where you go is going to affect who you meet, and who you meet is going to affect whether you end up staying here or going here. It'll affect your career moves. And so, you know, life is kind of a series of building blocks. It's not all tidy. It can be pretty messy. But basically, you know, Daddy King laid a foundation, set an example, and encouraged his people to follow his example. And it built and had an impact on a community. And so, yeah, you could probably argue against that, but um, what I'm learning is that Daddy King was the Luther, was the guy that really was a game changer, and that Martin took his example. So, you know, Martin was influenced by other people, by Gandhi, uh, by Bonhoeffer, other, you know, there were other people that he... Um, uh, uh, learned from and, and drew on in his work, but nothing could replace that example that his father uh, made for him. Um, one minute drill, okay? So, Montgomery Bus Boycott. Um, maybe my father and I have earned the right to our name in uh, the letter from Birmingham Jail. He's, he was in jail and an Episcopal bishop was calling him an extremist. And he said, well, let's talk about other extremists. Uh, Jesus, pretty big extremist. Paul, uh, Martin Luther, all extremists. Um, he went north to, the, uh, to Chicago, and uh, he marched to City Hall from Soldier Field, where the Bears play. And uh, he posted 14 complaints on the door 
of City Hall and the Chicago Tribune said um, that it was a declaration of the American Reformation. Um, and the night before he was killed, uh, he took the audience on a journey through time and he said, if I could have, you know, maybe I could have lived in the time of the apostles and I would have um, sat at their feet. Um, or I, and then I considered um, the great philosophers and was with them. And then I saw uh, my namesake, Martin Luther, nailing the 95 Theses on the door of the Castle Church. Um, but I didn't stop there. Then I saw Abraham Lincoln. So he just went on this journey through time uh, saying that now is, my, now is the time. I can't think of any other time um, that, you know, where I want to be. And, you know, I've, I've seen the mountaintop. This is the place. I've seen the promised land, and I may not get there with you. Just like Moses, he got almost there after 40 years in the wilderness, and he got there, but he, he died before they crossed over, as did Dr. King. And so, you know, Dr. King used Luther to kind of shore up um, strategically um, to push back using a important white historical figure to, you know, push back to hold that mirror up to uh, the powers that were trying to tear him down. Um, when he signed his name, he originally uh, just would say Reverend M. L. King, then he got his doctorate. Reverend Dr. M. L. King, and then he would go Reverend Dr. Martin L. King, Jr. But eventually, the Reverend, so the holy man, doctor, a learned man, Martin Luther, an important social change agent, King, a regal, powerful name, but then the humility of Junior. So that's how he eventually signed everything, the whole name. Um, so we know a lot about Junior, don't we? We know a lot about MLK, but we don't know too much about Senior. And so what I think, I'm, I'm going to do this Broadway musical on Daddy King. Dr. King will be a part of it, of course, but it's going to be about senior, and it'll probably be called senior. So thank you for your time and listening to the story, and I hope that you learned a little bit.